Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome back to part two. And um, in this talk, we're going to pick up where we left off. I mentioned about winners and losers as machine learning transforms radiology. You can see things that are coming on a weekly basis. This is in November. A new algorithm can spot pneumonia better than a radiologist. This article here talking about the ability to detect pulmonary nodules and determine benign from malignant perhaps as a second reader. Or you can see our deep learning based detection algorithm outperformed physicians in radiographic classification and nodule detection for malignant pulmonary nodules on chest radiographs. And when used as a second reader it enhances physician performance. Implications when accompanied by our deep learning based algorithm physicians improve nodule detection. What can be simpler than that? Or this article looking at musculoskeletal radiographs where their performance for looking at fractures at the wrist is as good as radiologists. Other areas not quite there yet and that got um, FDA approval because it helps. And the FDA statement, the software marks the location of the fracture and the image to aid the provider in detection and diagnosis. So here we're talking about AIDS. And again, you can see that it's not perfect, but in many places where there aren't radiologists, many ERs, many small hospitals, offices, it is an adjunct tool and not intended to replace a clinician's review of the radiograph or his or her clinical judgment. But it can be used, and that's what you're going to see happening. And Or in this application, um, here's another where it analyzes the images again in conjunction with things. You, briefcase uses an artificial intelligence algorithm to analyze images and highlight cases with detective intracranial hemorrhage on a standalone desktop. Okay? The device does not alter the original medical image and is not intended to be used as a diagnostic device. Again, human experts and machines have different strengths but machines can analyze large volumes of data and find complex associations hidden within data that might be otherwise hard for a human to do. So again, it's this change, this merging. Again, physicians must proactively guide, oversee, and monitor the adoption of AI as a partner in healthcare. So perhaps it's going to be a partner, though, as Jeff Hinton, one of the founders of AI said, you know, if you're a radiologist, perhaps you're like Wiley e. Coyote and you just haven't looked over the edge yet. As that's all folks. I don't think that's what's going to happen. And no, you still need to train radiologists, but how we train radiologists and how radiologists practice will surely be impacted. And it's not just radiology. Here's an article, and this was from Google, about pathologists detecting lymph node metastasis in patients with breast cancer. And you can see from this algorithm and from this article that the computer was better than the best pathologist, faster and more accurate. And you can see this recent article using AI as a way of predicting Alzheimer's on 18F FDG PET. Again, another application. Process is the same. Can it do better or equal to the humans? And yes, the study has several limitations, but you can see what direction things are going and how quickly they're getting there. And again, the conclusion, look at the results. Deep learning algorithm developed for early prediction of Alzheimer's achieved 82% specificity at 100% sensitivity, an average of 75.8 months prior to the final diagnosis. Indeed, very impressive. And again, this whole idea of how we merge data, how we merge AI into clinical practice is going to be a challenge. Here's another article just published, Classification Mutational Prediction for Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer, Histopathology Images Using Deep Learning. Again, not only could you say malignant or non-malignant, but predict which will be the gene abnormalities. So not only saying cancer, no cancer, but getting down, giving much more information. Now, the McKinsey report does talk about how patients can benefit from the rise of AI in healthcare. There are so many different ways, better decision making, better selection of therapy, better management are all things that people talk about. Now in radiology it's easy. We talk about how we look at CTs, right? 
Can we add cinematic? Will that make a difference? Do we go beyond the axials? Of course we do. But how can you speed up the process of using all of the techniques and yet not slowing down the process? We know that this is a simple case of pancreatic cancer. You can see it better on the coronals and, and uh, the volume rendered. But this whole idea about cinematic rendering, the detail it provides. And so when you look at this case, where no one saw the tumor in the cinematic rendering shows you the tumor in the uncinate, which was already encasing the mesenteric veins. So again, the ability to see more and recognize more is the promise of AI. And again, how we build that into our practice. Now we're looking at detecting pancreatic cancer at Hopkins, and I've spoken about this, but just to remind you, first you teach the computer how to read normal scans. And we've taught the computer based on our segmentation to be able to perfectly read all the organs and define their borders in the, in the body. And we use supervised learning. And of course, supervised learning is painful and it's difficult and it's time consuming, but it's the reason that we've done so well. And again, in some things, unsupervised learning will work, but not in the difficult task we want to provide. And look how good we are from the image to annotation and look at the prediction. The computer predicts exactly what the best radiologist will predict. And we're in the 90% range, which is basically 100%. All the margins are well defined. And so part of it is just how we taught the computer. Part of it is better data sets. But you can see this one-to-one -one relationship of computer and reader is becoming clear. And we could segment not only the pancreas, which is the main reason for our study, but all of the other organs. And then the second year, we've been teaching the computer to read and define pancreatic cancer. And look how well the computer can do predicting the pancreas and predicting the tumor. And you can see in this example, look at the image, the label, and single and multiple phase. Purple or blue is the pancreas, red is the tumor. Look how good the computer does. It does the same as the individual reader, okay, and the individual labeler. And the computer is done without any intervention. And you can see from these cases, whether we look at arterial phase or we look at venous phase, it's amazing how well the computer can do now. We're at about the 90% accuracy range, and we plan on going even better than that. And we've developed techniques, course to fine. We've developed this recurrent saliency transformation network that allows us to, and allows the computer to find the pancreas, then detail around the pancreas, then look at the gland carefully, pulling out all the critical information. And that's the way we're able to develop an algorithm which can find the pancreas, but also find tumor. And again, this is a novel technique, and I think with AI, one of the critical things is developing novel techniques. Now, the technique we have, I believe, will not only work in the pancreas, but in other organs, but we're focusing on the pancreas. And the idea of a 2D and 3D framework becomes important. One of the things we're looking at is what's the best technique for maximizing detection? Is it 2D, is it 3D? Is it a combination of the two? That's something that indeed becomes very important. I've also spoken about radiomics. Imagine radiomics now also built in. The ability to look at all the individual features, the ability to understand what's in the data, not just what the radiologist sees, but those unknown unknowns, what the radiologist isn't seeing, this high dimensional data, and the ability to look at the information radiomics provides, whether it's detecting tumor, detecting response to chemotherapy, or predicting outcomes are all things that you're beginning to see from many of the articles that are being published on radiomics. And again, how we use radiomics is a bit of a black box that we're trying to unravel it, but you can have first order statistics, which is the distribution of individual voxel values, histogram-based methods, mean, median, maximum, minimum, things like kurtosis, entropy, skewness, and then the second order sort of features, the interrelationships between voxels of similar values, co-occurrence matrices, grayscale level run length matrices, as you see here. And then, of course, higher order statistics, different filter grids, different wavelengths, Laplacian and Gaussian filters, all things to enhance the variation 
between normal and abnormal tissues and allow you to detect normal and then hopefully also allow you to predict what the tumor is, then predict the optimal management and then predict the outcomes. So the overall process is one of finding the pancreas, analyzing the pancreas, differentiating autoimmune pancreatitis from cancer, cancer from normal pancreas. And again, you build all this into a process which runs on its own. In radiomics, just classifying 488 features and creating signatures, whether it's for normal or it's for abnormal. And once you have this signature, your accuracy for de de detecting pancreatic cancer approaches 100% and specificity 99%. Just impressive examples. And again, it's not the 488 features. There's five main relevant features, texture, shape, wavelengths. But again, how we use those features is going to become very important and how we optimize the radiomics information, make sure it's reproducible and make sure it's not just occurring in the lab where it works. And again, how we distinguish different tumor types, predicting cystic lesions as to being aggressive, predicting cystic lesions which should be operated on versus followed. I think those are all things that can be built into this pancreas deep learning platform. And there's been some work now showing you can predict patient survival. We did some work at the recent MICAI meeting about that. Seung Park finished second in the prediction model. Uh, there are a number of publications talking about predicting treatment, predicting survival, predicting management. And we're looking back at trying to figure out how we can do that even better. The treatment response, why give patients the wrong therapy for two months? Figure out who's gonna respond to drug A or drug B and make the right choices before you have to make any decision. Now, will it make radiologists obsolete? I think the concern people have is, well, if it gets good enough, will they really need us? I can't say, but unless you create value for yourself, you could be in problem. Now, this idea of precision medicine, data-driven, the idea that individual variations in genes, environment, and lifestyle, and precision medicine aims to provide data-driven treatments suited to the genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors. This precision medicine is really what you're doing when you're doing radiomics, or you're doing the AI, or you're doing the texture mapping. Again, it's being put in place some areas in oncology, but its role is still limited and the opportunity is tremendous. The question is where would it all fit in? In this article by Choi, in conclusion with the current face pace in development of machine learning techniques and deep learning in particular, uh, there is a prospect for more widespread clinical adoption in radiology practices. And again, you can see techniques can potentially facilitate workflow, radiologist productivity, improve the detection and interpretation of findings, reduce the chance of error, and enhance patient care and satisfaction. That's like everything we do, we can fix. There's a great book I read, Prediction Machines, The Simple Economics of Artificial Intelligence. It's a couple hour read, maybe four hours, three hours, depends on how fast you read. It's an excellent book which talks about what you're doing with AI is predicting. And say AI is prediction machines. But it made me think about it. When I read a scan, I say it's a pancreatic mass. I say it's a neuroendocrine tumor. I say it's a spend. I'm making a prediction. Obviously need a biopsy, but I'm making a prediction. And you can see how AI is really predicting and making decisions. Now, how radiologists will exist in the future, that is going to change, but I still think we are gonna have our important role. Some people wonder about combining radiology and pathology. That could be a very interesting thing, and so I don't really rule anything off the table. The only thing I'm sure of is things will not be as they are now. Um, now, in this article, they talked about roles for radiologists, at least in the short and medium term. Choosing the image, using real-time images and medical procedures, biopsies, interpreting machine output, training machines on new technology, and employing judgment that may lead to overriding the prediction machines, perhaps on information unavailable to the machine. But you can see this quote from the book I just mentioned really makes the point that our reign may be challenged in the future. 
So again, we're going to have to be on top of this process and change like we always have. Winston Churchill said many things, but the empires of the future are the empires of the mind. It's never been truer today. And I think as we look at AI and its impact on medicine, and we will continue to update you monthly, yearly, on CT is Us, on Facebook, on all of our things. Remember, on CT is Us now, we have our own AI page. We have a lot of the material. You found this lecture there. You find a lot of things, including many lectures from NVIDIA. So I think it's an exciting area, and I think hopefully it will make radiology only better. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention, and have a great day.